Hello, uh, my name is Gopala Vasudevan. Today we'll talk about chapter two of international finance and this chapter deals with the flow of funds. So in this chapter we want to talk about you know what are some of the factors that can influence money from one country to another. Okay? So here, uh, what are some of the topics we cover? We will talk about the key components of the balance of payment. So we want to talk about the balance of payment for a country and the factors that enter into the balance of payment. We will talk about how international trade flows are influenced by economic factors and other factors. Okay, so what are some of the country variables that can affect the uh, flow of money? And then we will also talk about how international capital flows are influenced by country characteristics. So basically here there are two things we talk about. One is the international trade flows and the second is international capital flows. Okay? So before we talk about the chapter, uh, I want to talk about a conversation between Christine Romer and Larry Summers. So you might have heard about Larry Summers. Larry Summers was the Treasury Secretary under President Obama. So in 2008, just after the financial crisis, when President Obama came into power, one of his principal advisors was Larry Summers. And Larry Summers was the president of Harvard University. He was also a very well-known economist and an economics professor at Harvard. The other person was Christine Romer, and Christine Romer was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration. So there, you know, she was very influential. Again, she was, uh, prior to this position, she was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, in economics. And what I have here is an article she wrote in the New York Times, and basically what she was saying was, is it good to have a strong dollar, or is it better to have a weak dollar. But that was the conversation they had and this talks about they were traveling together to have some meetings with politicians uh, before her confirmation. And the question uh, Larry Summers was asking was what do you think about the exchange rate and whether the government should control the dollar. So that is a question that Larry Summers was asking Christine Romer, and what was Christine Romer's answer? Her answer was, the exchange rate is a price much like any other price and is determined by market forces. So basically here, what she is saying is that just the price of like any other commodity, you can also think about the dollar as a commodity. And in this case, the price of the commodity or the exchange rate would depend upon the demand and supply for that commodity. Okay, that's what we have. And that was uh, Christine Romer's answer. And Larry Summers' reply was, no, you're not correct. The exchange rate is the purview of the Treasury. The US is in favor of a strong dollar. So basically, his answer was that it can be controlled by the government, in this case, by the Federal Reserve. And in this case, it, uh, the US definitely would like to have a strong dollar. And her argument, basically she talks about the pros and cons of having a strong US dollar. So she looks at two scenarios. So she is a Democrat and clearly her answers or her uh, article here supports a democratic government. Okay? And suppose American entrepreneurs create many products that foreigners want to buy and start many companies they want to invest in. So basically here, the time she's talking about is when President Bill Clinton was in power. So there was a lot of innovation going on in the US. We also had a lot of new products and people from outside wanted to invest in those companies and wanted to buy those products. So what will happen to the dollar? That was part of the article that she wrote. And basically what she was saying was that in this case, the value of the dollar is going to increase. And the reason why the value of the dollar will increase is because the products that Americans make will be bought by foreign people and all of them need to buy the US dollar so that they can buy the goods. And in this case, the supply of dollars will fall and that can increase the value of the dollar even more. And basically here she says that was what was happening in the late 1990s when the dollar was indeed strong. Okay.
So in this case, a strong dollar, the reason why the dollar became strong was because of increased demand for the dollar, and the reason why there was an increased demand for the dollar was because of the increased demand for U.S. products. And people needed to buy dollars in order to buy the U.S. products. So that's one case. And what is the second case? The second case I think she's referring to took place when President Ronald Reagan was the president and when he came into power, what happened was the US was running a large budget deficit and mainly because of that, interest rates were rising. Okay, so in this case, what is the problem here? Higher American interest rates make both foreigners and Americans want to buy more American bonds and fewer foreign bonds. So let's say you are in Europe, you might want to buy the US bonds because they are giving you a higher interest rate. Okay, that's what we see. And basically here, she's talking about President Ronald Reagan. When he came to power, he did uh, quite a few tax cuts and he also increased military spending. And at this time, because of these actions, the government was running large deficits, and these deficits, along with the anti-inflationary policies, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve was Paul Walker, and he had to increase the interest rates. And because he increased interest rates, more people wanted to invest in the US. And basically, what she's saying is that, typically, that may not be good for the US. And the reason why it may not be good is because, in this case, the dollar is strengthening against foreign currencies, okay? And what is the problem here? When, when we have a strong dollar, essentially what that means is that for companies that are US-based, so that could be a GM exporting cars to Europe, in this case, they either have to increase the price of the US cars or they have to cut their profits. So there, a strong dollar typically can hurt a country, especially when it is exporting. On the other hand, a strong dollar might not be bad when your economy is doing good. That is okay. On the other hand, when the economy is weak, as we had in 2008, having a strong dollar can hurt your exports, and in, in that case, it can also hurt U.S. employment. Because people, U.S. exports are not competitive, it means that U.S. companies might not be able to hire more workers. So that could be a bad case, and what we are saying here is that in such a case, it's better to have a weaker dollar. And in that article she wrote, that was what she was saying, let us let the dollar go down in value. And that was pretty much what happened in 2008. Because the dollar was weaker against other currencies, it made US exports more competitive, it also created more jobs in the US. So now we want to talk about the materials in chapter two. And in chapter two, we want to talk about the balance of payment. So what is the balance of payment? The balance of payment is a summary of the transactions between the domestic and foreign residents for a specific country over a specific period of time. So for example, for the US, we are talking about a summary of transactions between the US and other foreign countries for a specific period of time. So that could be a year, that could be a quarter, and so on. So what are the components of the balance of payment? The first one is the current account. And the current account is a summary of the flow of funds due to purchases of goods or services or the provision of income on financial assets. So in this case, we are talking about uh, you know, US purchases of foreign goods, foreign services, and foreign purchases of uh, US goods and US services. And basically the current account summarizes the flow of funds because of these actions, okay? What about the capital account? The capital account is a summary of the flow of funds resulting from the sale of assets between one specific country and all other countries over a specific period of time. So what is the principal difference? In the case of the current account, we are talking about purchases of goods and services. In the case of the capital account, we are talking about the sale of assets. So that is the principal difference. So let's look at the components of the current account. Uh, 
So the current account, the components are, the first is payments for merchandise and services. So the US is buying stuff from, let's say China, that would be a payment for a merchandise. And in this case, let's say a foreign government, let's say Mexico is buying certain services from US companies. So those are examples of the payments for merchandise and services. The second one is factor income payments. So what are examples of factor income payments? Foreign nationals are buying bonds. So they could be buying the US treasury bonds. And when they buy the US treasury bonds, the US government had to make coupon payments or interest payments. That is one example. Or foreign people are buying the stocks of US companies. Let's say they invest in IBM, they invest in Oracle and so on. And from their investments, these companies have to make dividend payments. So that would be an example of a factor income payment. And the last one is transfer payment. So what is an example of a transfer payment? We are talking about payments for fine aid. So for example, there is a flood in Haiti and the US government is sending uh, things, food, clothing and so on, medicines to the people in Haiti. That is an example of a transfer payment. Okay, so here we have quite a few examples. The first one, JCPenney purchases uh, stereos produced in Indonesia that will sell in the US retail store. So basically here, that is uh, JCPenney, which is a US company, making a payment for a good that is being purchased from abroad. In this case, that is an, from Indonesia. And that is a cash outflow, and as far as the account is concerned, that is a debit in the current account. Uh, the next one, let's look at the last one, uh, University Bookstore in Ireland purchases textbooks produced by a US publishing company. So again, it's a foreign company that is buying goods, in this case textbooks, from a US publisher. And as far as the US is concerned, that is a cash inflow, and that is a credit as far as the US accounts are concerned. Okay? So in all these cases, we have payments for goods, and we also want to talk about payments for services. Okay? Now the next one, international income transactions. So the second item we have is factor income payment, and factor income payments talks about income transactions. So here, a US investor receives a dividend payment from a French firm in which she purchased stock. So we are talking about a dividend being received by a US investor, and that would be an example of a US cash inflow and resulting from the investment that is being made, and that is a credit. Okay? The last one is a Mexican company that borrowed dollars from a bank based in the US sends an interest payment to that bank. So here, what we have is that we have a Mexican company that uh, is you know, borrowed in dollars from a US bank and it has to make a payment that could be an interest payment to the US bank. And how does it look like? That is a cash inflow as far as the US is concerned and that is a credit. So both of these are examples of factor income payments. Okay? The last one is we want to talk about gifts and so on. So that would be an example of a transfer payment. So the US states provides aid to Costa Rica in response to a flood in Costa Rica. So there, that is a gift, and here, that is a cash outflow, and that is a debit, and that's an example of a factor income payment. Okay? So this summarizes the current account of the US in 2008. And if you remember, 2008 was one of the worst times as far as the US economy was concerned. So the first item we have is US exports of merchandise, and that was $1,148 billion. The next is US exports of services, 497, and then US income receipts, that's 818. So the total US exports and income receipts is 2,463. So what are the three components here? The three components we have are exports of merchandise, okay? exports of services, and you have income receipts. So overall, they add up to $2,463 billion.
After that, we have the U.S. imports of merchandise, and that is $1,967 billion. So what we see here is that the U.S. is importing a lot more products from outside when compared to the exports. So it's around $800 billion more in imports. Now the next item is the U.S. imports of services, that is 378. So what we see here is that in terms of service, the U.S. exports are 497 versus 378. So overall, as far as services is concerned, they are doing quite good. Okay? And the last one is U.S. income payments are 737 and U.S. income receipts are 818. So in the first uh, item, that is exports versus imports, the U.S. has a deficit. The other two, U.S. has a surplus. And the total U.S. imports and income payments are 3,082. So what we see here is that uh, the net transfers by the U.S. is 1812 and the current account balance is a negative 731. So what we see here is that overall the U.S. has a deficit as far as the current account is concerned. Now the next is we want to talk about the capital and financial accounts. So what are the capital and financial accounts? The first is direct foreign investment and what are some examples of direct foreign investment? One example would be a, a, multi, a firm from outside is coming and acquiring a U.S. firm. So in chapter one, we talked about Anheuser-Busch, and Anheuser-Busch was acquired by a Belgian company that is in Bell. So that is an example of a direct foreign investment. The next one is portfolio investment. So here we are talking about foreign nationals investing in U.S. companies by buying the stock as well as their bonds. Okay. The third one is other capital investment. So what is an example of other capital investment? One example would be foreign nationals buying the treasury bills and treasury notes and so on. So there, that is the money market. So money market typically talks about short-term uh, funds raised by the U.S. government. Typically, they talk about uh, securities less than one year. And the last item is the errors and omissions. And what do we have? The negative current account may not be the same as the positive capital and financial account. So basically here, we want to balance these items and that's the reason why we have the last part and that is the errors and omissions, okay? So in uh, Exhibit 2.4, what it tells you is that it tells you the distribution of U.S. exports and imports. And this was in 2008. And what we see here is that when you look at the U.S. exports, the most exports take place to Canada, that is 20%. After that, we have Mexico, 12%. 20 plus 12, 32% takes place with our immediate neighbors. And the reason why that takes place is mainly because of the NAFTA. We have, these are very close countries in terms of location, and they're also very close trading partners, okay? After that, we have uh, exports to Japan is 5%, Germany is 4%, uh, UK is 4%, and France is 2%. So these are some of the countries that where we export most. And when you talk about the imports, what we see is that with Canada, we import 16%, and with Mexico, we import 10%. So when you add them together, what we find is that 32% of our exports take place to Canada and Mexico, and 26% of our imports are with the same two countries. So overall, the U.S. has a trade surplus with those countries. Now, what we find is that the biggest imports we have is from China, 16%, and our exports are only 5%. So that's one of the reasons why we have a trade deficit, and people always talk about this, that is we are importing a lot more products than we export to China. Okay? So this summarizes some of the things we talked about, the U.S. balance of trade trend, value has grown substantially over time, and impact of the huge balance of trade deficit would lead to higher U.S. employment, unemployment, but increases competition, leading to more efficient production. So there, basically from chapter one, what we said was we have, the, we talked about the reasons why companies want to manufacture in other countries, and we talked about the law of comparative advantage. So basically here, production means to countries that are more efficient, okay?
So when you talk about international trades, what are some of the reasons why international trade increased? So some of the reasons are, one is the removal of the Berlin Wall. So basically, the, the Berlin Wall was a border or a wall between East Germany and West Germany. And after the two Germanys united, came together, a symbolic act was the removal of the Berlin Wall. And what is the significance? The economic significance is that these are two very large countries, and by uniting, they became more powerful in terms of economics. Okay? And others were the Single European Act of 1987, the inception of the Euro, and expansion of the European Union. So these three things, the number three, number five, and number six, what they did was they encouraged trading between European countries. And the reason why the European countries wanted to have a currency that was the Euro was because they wanted to become strong economically and basically they wanted to stand up against the US dollar. Okay? Now we also have the North American Free Trade Agreement and again this talks about the agreement between the US and some of the closest countries and initially that was with Mexico, that was with Canada, and then it expanded to other countries in South America and so on. Okay? And the reason why we have that is because we wanted to basically encourage trade within these countries. We also wanted to have more efficient allocation of resources. Okay? Now we want to talk about what are some of the reasons why we have trade frictions. And some of the reasons why we have trade frictions are the first is environmental restrictions. So as an example, the environmental laws in the US are much more tougher than, let's say, compared to China, or compared to India, or compared to Brazil. And sometimes US firms complain that because of these tougher restrictions, they cannot compete more effectively against other companies in China, India, and so on. Okay? The second one is labor laws. And what we see is that in some of the countries, let's say Pakistan and Indonesia and other countries, although there are laws prohibiting child labor, they're not strictly enforced. And in this case, by allowing children to do manufacturing and other things, they are able to produce the same items at a lower cost. And ethically, it may not be good as far as you know, these companies are concerned. What is the third factor? The third factor is bribes. And some examples are, if you go to Nigeria, the Nigerian government still has a warrant against Dick Cheney, who was the vice president under President Bush. And the warrant is because Dick Cheney was previously the president of Halliburton, the CEO of Halliburton. And as the CEO, uh, he was responsible, or at least indirectly responsible, for making bribes to some of the Nigerian officials. And there, that was the friction that took is between the US and in this case Nigeria. And another example of friction is government subsidies. So two of the biggest airline manufacturing companies are Airbus. Airbus is a European company and that was supported by some of the countries in Europe such as France, England and Germany. And they are a very effective competitor against Boeing, which is a private company based in the US. And the main complaint is that these governments, these European governments are providing a lot of support to Airbus, which makes it more competitive against uh, Boeing, which is primarily a private company. Okay? And other examples of government subsidies are the Chinese uh, government, they support a lot of their businesses, and directly or indirectly, they, are, they have a lot of say as far as these companies are concerned. And again, the typically other companies based in other uh, countries say that by having this government support, they tend to have an unfair advantage. Okay? And the last one is that the governments can also provide tax breaks to certain industries, which can make them more competitive. Okay? So again, you know, the Indian government used to provide a lot of tax breaks for software companies. And that was one of the reasons why those software companies were able to develop and become more competitive. Okay? Now we also have 
sometimes frictions because of trade policies. And what are some of the examples of trade policies? The first is using the exchange rate as a trade policy. Now, this talks about China and the U.S., so what we find is that, especially when the U.S. has an election year, there is a lot of hue and cry, and what we see is that uh, most of the time, politicians blame China of deliberately keeping their currency at a low exchange rate when compared to the U.S. dollar. And why do they do that? The primary reason why they do that is because they want to make the Chinese exports more competitive. Okay, that's one example. And a more recent example is Japan. So when the new president came into power, what a lot of the uh, Japanese corporations asked him to do was try to keep the exchange rate at or above 100. So 100 yen to 1 US dollar. And by keeping it at that rate, what they are doing is that, again, they are making Japanese exports more competitive against the US uh, in the US, okay? Uh, people also talk about managerial decisions about outsourcing. And what we say is that, especially in the US, a lot of jobs, especially in technology, have been outsourced. And there was a lot of hue and cry about that. Now, what US companies say is that only by outsourcing can we be more competitive. And in the US, especially under President Obama, basically there have been some changes in the rules, and basically what they're saying is that uh, they are basically reducing the tax benefits that arise from outsourcing jobs to foreign countries, okay? Now, you also have trade policies for security reasons, and what we are saying here is that in the US, the US blocked the acquisition of a US company by a company based in China, that is Huawei, and the reason why they stopped that acquisition is because the company that this Chinese company was acquiring was located very close to some sensitive US uh, you know, data and so on. So given that they did not want a foreign company to be so close to uh, the US installations for security reasons, okay? And other reasons are using trade policies for political reasons. And you know, what we have is, again, in the election year, uh, US politicians complain about China. They, they talk about you know, Chinese companies becoming more competitive, mainly because of a lower Chinese currency value, and also because of support to Chinese companies from the Chinese government. So these are a couple of examples. Now, if you look at foreign governments, governments always complain about the U.S. subsidies to food. And here, what we are saying is that in the U.S., there is a lot of support for farmers and for developers of food and food products. And the reason being that the U.S. wants to ensure that, at least in the U.S., prices are relatively low and people have free access, not free access, but have reasonable access to food. And in the, if you look at Russia, Russia complains that U.S. farmers have an unfair advantage because of the U.S. government support. Okay? Now, what about factors that affect international trade flows? So what are some of the reasons why uh, you have trade flows? The first is inflation. And what we are saying here is that current account decreases if inflation increases related to the trade partners. So what we are saying is that, let's look at the case where inflation is very high in the US. And in this case, what we can expect is, we can expect the current account to go down. And the reason why the current account goes down is because when inflation is very high in the US, it means that prices of goods are more expensive in the US, which would imply that US companies would prefer to import more products from outside rather than produce them in the US. And because of that, the current account is going to decrease. Okay? The next one is, what about national income? And here, current account decreases if national income increases related to other countries. So what does it mean? Basically, what it means is that when times are good, when the economy is doing better, when people have more money in their pockets, we are saying that the current account is going to decrease. So in some ways, that is counterintuitive. 
And here, the reason why that happens is because as the economy gets better, as people have more money in their pockets, chances are they're going to buy more products and they could be importing more products from outside. So that's the reason why the national income can go down. Now, what are other factors? Other factors that can affect international trade flows are subsidies for exporters, okay? So we talked about software in India. So there are subsidies for exporters. Similarly, if you look at solar panels, there is a lot of subsidies for manufacturing of solar panels as well as for exporters solar panels provided by the Chinese government. Uh, the other factors are restrictions on imports. So sometimes to make sure that there is protection for the local manufacturers, governments can restrict imports or they can put a high taxes on importing products from outside. And the last one is lack of restriction on piracy. So what we see here is that usually the U.S. government and U.S. Uh, companies have concerns about the lack of piracy laws in China and in India. And what is the problem for U.S. companies? The main problem for U.S. companies is that, let's say you look at a company like Microsoft, their exports to India or to China would be a lot higher if the piracy laws, especially copying of software products, are enforced better in these countries. So there, that is an example of a government policy that is not very, uh, that is not being, you know, not much action being taken against piracy. And because of that, exports to that country would be decreased. Okay, now, what we see is that, what are some of the factors that affect the current account, one factor would be the exchange rates. And what we are saying is that current account decreases if currency appreciates relative to other currencies. Now, why does it happen as, let's say, the US dollar is increasing against the Canadian dollar? So in that case, chances are people in the US will import more products from Canada. And because of that, the current account could be decreasing. At the same time, when you talk about exports, exports would decrease because uh, for the foreign countries, the prices of the U.S. goods will increase because of the increase in the value of the U.S. dollar. So what we see here is that, based upon what we talked about earlier, what we find here is that a strong U.S. dollar can hurt the exports, can increase the imports, and in turn, that will affect the current account. Okay? Now, what can a country do in such a case? In such a case, as we saw at the beginning of this lecture, what we said was one of the ways a, 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 a country can actively do something is to deliberately let the currency go down in value against other currencies. So we talked about the U.S., we talked about Christine Romer, and her strategy was, she was saying that, especially when the economy is weak, you should let the U.S. dollar depreciate against the foreign currencies. Now, we talked about Japan, and in Japan, that's exactly what they did. When the new president came, he deliberately let the Japanese yen weaken against most of the other major currencies. Now, what is the problem with this? What are some of the limitations of that? The first one is counter-pricing by competitors. So what we are saying here is that when the Japanese government lets the Japanese yen goes down in value, that can make Sony more competitive against Samsung. That can also make Japanese car manufacturers like Toyota, Nissan, and so on become more competitive against Korean car companies such as Hyundai and uh, Kia, for example. Now, in this case, what we are saying is that there is a very good chance that Samsung or Hyundai is not going to sit still, so both Samsung and Kia will bring down the prices of their products so that they can compete more effectively against Sony as well as Toyota. So there, we are talking about counter-pricing by competitors.
Now, what about what else do we see here? Impact of other weak currencies. So what we are saying here is that right now, the US dollar is strong against not only the Japanese yen, but also against a lot of other currencies. So what that means is that the other countries with the weaker currencies, they also would be able to compete effectively, in this case, against Japanese companies, okay? What is the third thing? The third one is pre-arranged international transactions. So what does it mean? What we are saying is that, let's say the Japanese government lets the Japanese yen go down in value today. So let's assume that is February, that is when the Japanese government did this thing. Now what's gonna happen is that you might not see any immediate effect on the current account. So what we might see actually is that for some time, the current account might go down and after that, things might start to improve. And why does this happen? The reason why this happened is because when you talk about international trade, they don't take place instantaneously. A lot of the time, most of the trade that takes place today would have been arranged two or three months before which means that those trades will take place regardless of the exchange rate. And the fourth reason we have here is intra-company trade. So what we are saying is that GM has subsidiaries all over the world, and chances are these subsidiaries might trade between themselves regardless of the exchange rate. And so what we see here in practice is we have, so let's say that the US government or the Japanese government lets the currency go down in value. So what we might see is that in the short term, the trade balance might actually get worse before it gets better. And here, this is referred to as the J curve. So if you look at the textbook or if you look at some of the short questions, this is a very important uh, question that you can expect. That is the J curve and it tells you the relationship between a change in the exchange rate and what might happen to the trade deficit. And here, what we find is that in the short term, the current account will, uh, the trade balance might go down and after some time, things will start to reverse, okay? So what we see here is that FX of the Euro explain how the existence of the Euro may affect US international trade. So at the beginning of class, we said that one of the reasons for the increase of international trade was the inception of the Euro. Now, is it good or bad for the US? What we are saying here is that in, in this case, having a Euro is, having the uh, Euro come up in some ways would hurt the US. It would hurt the US dollar and it would hurt US companies. And the reason being that by having one currency, which is Euro, the European countries would be able to trade between themselves. They do not have to worry about exchange rate risk. So in this case, that would hurt US international trade. Now, what is the benefit? The benefit they might have is that, in this case, if you are a US company, such as Microsoft, they do not have to worry about trading with Japan, sorry, trading with Germany. They do not have to worry about the German mark, trading with Ita Italy, with the Italian lira, trading with France, with the French currency, and so on. Rather than worry about three or four currencies, they only have to worry about the exchange rate risk associated with a single currency, and that would be the euro. So that would be the benefit as far as US companies are concerned. But overall, the reason why European countries came up with the Euro was because they wanted to have a strong currency that would compete effectively against the US dollar and that would compete effectively